Welcome to Brainish English Stories. I can tell you, I said, it will need a very real ghost to scare me. I stood up by the fire, holding my glass. You chose this, the man with the withered arm said, looking at me strangely. For 28 years, I said, I've lived, and I've never seen a ghost. The old lady stared at the fire with her pale eyes wide open. Yes, she interrupted, and for 28 years, you've lived and never seen a house like this, I guess. There are many things to see when you're only 28, she shook her head slowly. Many things to see and be sad about. I thought the old folks were trying to make their house seem scarier with their dreary talk. I put down my empty glass on the table and looked around the room. I saw myself in a strange old mirror, looking shorter and whiter than usual. Well, I said, if I see anything tonight, I'll be wiser. I'm open minded about it. It's your choice, the man with the withered arm said again. I heard someone coming with a stick in the hallway outside, and the door creaked as another old man entered, even more bent, wrinkled, and older than the first. He walked with a crutch, had shaded eyes, and his lower lip hung pale and pink from his yellow teeth. He went straight to a chair on the other side of the table, sat down clumsily, and started to cough. The man with the withered arm looked at the new arrival with dislike, and the old woman paid no attention to him but kept her eyes on the fire. I said, It's your choice, the man with the withered arm repeated when the coughing stopped for a moment. It's my choice, I replied. The man with the shade noticed me for the first time and tilted his head to see me. I glimpsed his small, bright, and red eyes for a moment. Then he started to cough and splutter again. Why don't you have a drink? the man with the withered arm said, pushing the beer toward him. The man with the shade poured a glassful with a shaky hand. Spilling some on the table. A huge shadow of him appeared on the wall, mimicking his movements as he poured and drank. I must admit, I didn't expect these strange caretakers. To me, old age seems inhuman, like something primitive and hunched over. Their silence, stooped posture, And their obvious unfriendliness toward me and each other made me uneasy. If, I said, you could lead me to the haunted room, I'll make myself comfortable there. The old man with the cough jerked his head back so suddenly that it surprised me, and he gave me another quick look with his red eyes under the shade. But no one answered me. I waited for a minute. Looking at each of them. If, I said a bit louder, can you show me your spooky room? I'll save you from entertaining me. There's a candle by the door outside, said the man with the withered arm, looking at my feet while talking to me. But if you go to the red room tonight, this night of all nights, the old woman added. You go alone. All right, I replied. Which way should I go? You walk down the hallway for a bit, he said, until you reach a door. Through that door is a spiral staircase. About halfway up, there's a landing with another door covered with fabric. Go through that and down the long corridor. The red room is on your left, up the steps. Did I get that right? I asked and repeated his directions. He corrected me on one thing. 
And are you really going? said the man with the shade, looking at me once again with that strange, unnatural tilt of his face. This night of all nights, the old woman exclaimed. It's what I came for, I said and headed towards the door. As I did, the old man with the shade stood up and moved closer to the others and the fire. When I reached the door, I turned and looked at them. They were huddled together, dark against the firelight, staring at me over their shoulders with intense expressions on their ancient faces. Good night, I said, opening the door. It's your choice, said the man with the withered arm. I left the door wide open until the candle was lit, then I closed it, leaving them inside, and walked down the cold, echoing hallway. I must admit, the strangeness of these three old caretakers and the old-fashioned furniture in the room where they gathered, all of it affected me despite my efforts to stay calm. They seemed to belong to another time, an older time when spiritual things were different from today, less certain. A time when signs, witches, and ghosts were believed in. Their very presence was ghostly, their clothes and styles were from long ago. The room's decorations and objects were ghostly too, reminders of people long gone, still lingering in today's world. But I made myself stop thinking about it. The long, drafty underground passage was cold and dusty. My candle flickered, and shadows danced around. Echoes bounced up and down the spiral staircase, and a shadow followed me, and one rushed ahead into the darkness above. I reached the landing and paused, listening to a rustling sound that I thought I heard. Then, convinced it was absolutely silent, I pushed open the fabric-covered door and stood in the corridor. The scene wasn't what I expected. Moonlight from the big window on the grand staircase made everything look either black and shadowy or silver and bright. Everything was in its place, it seemed like the house had been empty just yesterday instead of eighteen months ago. There were candles in the wall sconces, and any dust that had collected on the carpets or the polished floor was so evenly spread that it couldn't be seen in the moonlight. I was about to move forward but stopped suddenly. A bronze statue stood on the landing, hidden from my view by the corner of the wall, but its shadow was very clear on the white wall. It looked like someone crouching to surprise me. I stood completely still for about half a minute, maybe less. Then, with my hand in the pocket where I kept my revolver, I cautiously moved forward. To my relief, it turned out to be a statue of Ganymede and an eagle shining in the moonlight. This incident helped me regain my confidence for a while. A porcelain Chinese figurine on a table, whose head moved silently as I passed by, hardly startled me. The door to the red room and the stairs leading to it were in a dark corner. I moved my candle from side to side to see the recess clearly before opening the door. I thought, this is where the previous person was found. The memory of that story made me feel a bit scared. I glanced at the Ganymede statue in the moonlight and quickly opened the door to the red room, keeping my face half turned towards the dim hallway. I entered the room, closed the door immediately, turned the key I found in the lock, and held up the candle to look around. I was in the great red room of Lorraine Castle, where the young duke had died, or at least where he had started dying. 
He had opened the door and fallen down the stairs I had just climbed. That was how his vigil had ended, his brave attempt to face the ghostly stories of the place. I thought that, strangely enough, apoplexy had helped superstition win. There were other old stories connected to this room, dating back to its beginnings, like the story of a nervous wife and the tragic end that followed her husband's attempt to scare her. As I looked around the large, dark room with its shadowy window bays, nooks, and corners, I could understand why legends had grown in its dark corners. My candle was like a small light in a huge room, unable to reach the far end, leaving a vast area of mystery and imagination in the darkness. I decided to carefully inspect the room to dispel any fanciful thoughts about it before they took hold of me. After checking that the door was locked, I began to walk around the room, looking behind every piece of furniture, lifting the bed's curtains, and opening them wide. I raised the blinds and checked the window's locks before closing the shutters. I leaned forward and looked up the wide chimney, tapped the dark wooden panels to see if there was a hidden opening, and examined every inch of the room. There were two large mirrors, each with candle holders, and on the mantel shelf, there were more candles in china candlesticks. I lit all of them, one after the other. The fire had already been set up, a surprising detail from the old housekeeper, so I lit it to keep warm and prevent myself from shivering. When it was burning nicely, I stood with my back to it, looking at the room again. I had placed a chintz-covered armchair and a table in front of me like a barrier, and my revolver was on it, within reach. My careful examination had calmed my nerves, but the distant darkness of the room and its absolute stillness were still unsettling. The crackling and rustling of the fire didn't bring me any comfort. The shadow in the alcove at the end, in particular, had that eerie feeling of a presence, the odd sense that there might be something hidden and alive lurking there, a feeling that easily arises in silence and solitude. To reassure myself, I eventually walked into the alcove with a candle and confirmed that there was nothing there. I placed the candle on the alcove floor and left it there. By now, I was quite nervous, although I couldn't find any good reason for it. My mind, however, was clear. I firmly believed that nothing supernatural could happen. To pass the time, I started making up some rhymes, like the stories from Ingoldsby. I said a few of them out loud, but the echoes made it uncomfortable. For the same reason, I also stopped talking to myself about ghosts and haunting after a while. I tried to keep my mind focused on the three strange old people downstairs. The room's dark red and black colors bothered me, even with seven lit candles. The one in the alcove flickered in the draft, and the shifting firelight kept the shadows moving. Trying to find a solution, I remembered the candles I had seen in the hallway. With a bit of effort, I walked out into the moonlight with a candle, leaving the door open, and came back with ten more candles. I placed them in various china decorations scattered around the room, lighting them in the darkest spots, some on the floor and some in the window alcoves. Now, my seventeen candles illuminated every inch of the room. I thought that when the ghost appeared, I could warn it not to trip over them. The room was well lit now. The small flames were reassuring, 
and snuffing them out gave me something to do and made me feel better about the passage of time. However, the anticipation of my vigil weighed on me heavily. After midnight, the candle in the alcove suddenly went out, and the dark shadow returned. I didn't see the candle go out. I just turned and saw the darkness, as if you suddenly notice a stranger nearby. I exclaimed, Wow, that draft is strong, and took the matches from the table. I walked across the room slowly to relight the corner candle. My first match didn't work, and when I succeeded with the second, something seemed to blink on the wall in front of me. I turned my head instinctively and saw that the two candles on the small table by the fireplace had gone out. I stood up right away. How strange. I said. Did I accidentally blow them out without realizing it? I went back, relit one of them, and while doing so, I saw the candle on the right side of one of the mirrors flicker and go out. Almost immediately, its companion candle did the same. There was no mistake about it. The flames disappeared as if someone had pinched the wicks between their fingers, leaving the wicks black, not glowing or smoking. While I stood there, the candle at the foot of the bed also went out, and the shadows seemed to move closer to me. This isn't good. I said, my voice sounding strange and high-pitched. At that moment, the candle on the wardrobe went out, and the one I had just relit in the alcove followed suit. Hold on. I said. I need these candles, trying to sound half-joking as I frantically lit a match and struggled to light the candles on the mantel. My hands were shaking so much that I missed the rough part of the matchbox twice. With the same match, I managed to relight the larger mirror candles and the ones on the floor near the door, so I seemed to be winning against the darkness for a moment. But then, for lights vanished all at once in different parts of the room, and I struck another match in a trembling hurry, unsure of where to use it. As I stood there, unsure, it felt like an invisible hand swept out the two candles on the table. I cried out in terror, dashed at the alcove, then the corner, and finally the window, relighting three candles as two more disappeared by the fireplace. But then I realized a better plan, dropped the matches on the iron-bound deed box in the corner, and grabbed the candlestick from the bedroom. With this, I avoided the delay of striking matches, but the relentless darkness continued to close in on me. The shadows I feared were returning, creeping closer to me, first on one side and then on the other. It was like a ragged storm cloud covering the stars. Occasionally, one candle would briefly return and then vanish again. I was now almost in a panic due to the approaching darkness, and I lost control of myself. I jumped from candle to candle, panting and disheveled, trying to fight back the relentless advance. I bumped my thigh into the table, sent a chair flying, stumbled and fell, knocking the tablecloth off. My candle rolled away, and I grabbed another as I got up. Suddenly, I blew this one out as I swung it off the table by accident, and immediately the two remaining candles also went out. But there was still some light in the room a red glow from the fire that kept the shadows away from me. The fire. Of course, I could still use my candle to relight it. I turned toward the flames, 
which were still dancing among the glowing coals and casting red reflections on the furniture. I took two steps towards the fireplace, and suddenly the flames shrank and disappeared, the glow vanished, the reflections merged and vanished. As I tried to thrust the candle between the bars of the grate, darkness closed in on me like closing eyes, wrapping around me tightly, blinding me, and crushing the last bit of reason from my mind. The candle fell from my hand. I flung my arms out in a futile attempt to push the overwhelming darkness away, and, raising my voice, I screamed as loud as I could once, twice, three times. Then I think I must have staggered to my feet. I vaguely remembered the moonlit hallway, and, with my head down and my arms covering my face, I rushed towards the door. But I had forgotten where exactly the door was and hit myself hard against the corner of the bed. I stumbled backward, turned, and either got hit or hit myself against some other heavy furniture. I have a blurry memory of bumping into things like this in the darkness, of struggling and crying out wildly as I darted around, of a heavy blow to my forehead, a terrible sensation of falling that seemed to last forever, of a final desperate attempt to stay on my feet, and then I remember nothing more. I woke up in the daylight with a rough bandage around my head. The man with the withered arm was looking at me. I tried to remember what had happened, but it took me a moment. I glanced at the old woman, who was no longer distant, but busy pouring some medicine from a small blue bottle into a glass. Where am I? I asked. I feel like I know you, but I can't remember who you are. They then explained, and I listened to the story of the haunted red room as if hearing a tale. We found you at dawn, the man said, and there was blood on your forehead and lips. I slowly began to recall my experience. You believe now, said the old man, that the room is haunted? He didn't speak as if I were an intruder, but as if he mourned for a lost friend. Yes, I replied, the room is haunted. And you've seen it. We, who've lived here all our lives, have never seen it because we've never dared. Tell us, is it really the old Earl who? No, I interrupted, it's not. I told you so, the old lady said, holding the glass. It's his poor young countess who got scared. No, I corrected, there's no ghost of an earl or countess in that room. There's no ghost there at all. But something worse, much worse. Well, they asked. The worst thing that torments human beings, I said, and that is, in all its rawness, fear. Fear that can't stand light or sound, that won't listen to reason, that deafens and darkens and overwhelms. It followed me through the corridor, it fought against me in the room. I stopped suddenly. There was a moment of silence. My hand went up to touch my bandages. Then the man with the shade sighed and spoke. That's it, he said. I knew that was it. A dark power. To place such a curse on a woman. It always lurks there. You can feel it even in the daytime, even on a bright summer day, in the curtains, in the hangings, lurking behind you no matter where you turn. In the evening, it creeps along the corridor and follows you, so you dare not turn around. There's fear in that room of hers, deep, black fear, 
and there will be, as long as this sinful house stands, 